Let's worship together. Brother Ron. Psalm 50, verse 23 says, Who oh, offereth praise glorifieth me. Let's begin by singing number 213. We will glorify number 213. And let's stand to sing, please. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lord. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before the strong. We will worship Him. one another and find a guest this morning. Take some time as we... be seated. We want to pause for just a moment and have a special prayer for a few folks. We, uh, this past week has been a very eventful week. We've had a lot of people having surgeries and different things happening. And uh, I just want to mention a few of those. As, as has already been mentioned, uh, Bonnie Fugate is just uh, barely hanging on. Uh, Kathy and I went down yesterday to Moxville to visit with Bonnie and Jerry and the family, and uh, she's there in the nursing home in Moxville. I spoke with Jerry after the early service this morning, and uh, he was telling me that she's still just hanging on. So let's be sure and remember uh, Bonnie and Jerry Fugate. And then Carrie Stoker had surgery. I, I assume she is at home and, and uh, still trying to recover from her surgery this past week. R.L. Spencer one of our faithful uh, ushers and members, um, RL, some of you may not be aware of this, but he was having some problems, went to the doctor. They did a heart cath on him Friday and discovered that he had his main artery was 100% blocked. He had another artery that was 80% blocked. And so he's looking at um, uh, either three or four bypasses uh, in his heart this coming Tuesday. So pre please remember RL Spencer and his family. And then uh, Coley Gaffney is not doing well. Coley had a procedure this past week. He's still in the hospital. And uh, let's remember Coley and Alma. And then uh, a good word here. We have a couple in our church that is celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Wonder who it could be. I think his name is Don. <laughs> Y'all stand up, brother. Y'all stand up. Let's give him a good hand, okay? <laughs> God bless you and your family. That is, that is just awesome. That's wonderful. I know it's great to have your, your family with you today and a great, great time of celebration. We rejoice with you. Um, okay, I think that uh, takes care of, uh, of what I wanted to share with you. Let's, uh, let's pause and have prayer at this time for these that, that we've mentioned. Father, uh, we thank you so much for the power of prayer, for the privilege of prayer. And we come this morning uh, lifting up uh, these whose names we've mentioned today. You know each one. We pray for them. 
And we just ask you, Lord, to comfort them and strengthen them in a very special way. And, uh, Lord, uh, may you have your will and your way in Bonnie's life. And may you comfort the family as only you can. I pray for the others. You will heal their bodies and strengthen them. I pray for R.L. that you will be with him Tuesday as he undergoes this major heart surgery. I pray that you will protect him. You will guide the doctor's hands, eyes, and mind. And, um, Lord, help the team that will be uh, performing the surgery. Uh, help each one of them. Give them the expertise they need to do what needs to be done. And we'll be careful to praise you and thank you. Bless this service, Father. And we thank you for the early service this morning for Sunday school. And uh, thank you for those that are here. We pray for several who are out today because of this holiday weekend. And we pray that you will bless them as they travel and go about their activities today. And we praise you for all that you do for us because you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Ron. Tomorrow's Labor Day, and one of the things we like to do is honor those who are working in America. That's the purpose of Labor Day. So appropriately, let's sing America the Beautiful. It's number 630 in your hymnal, and let's stand to sing, please. sing this song, I pray that you would think about bowing the knee through your struggles, through the trials that we go through in life. A lot of times those are more than the high points of life. But I pray that you will bow the knee as we sing this song.
favorite hymns, this next one would be probably number one or number two, and can it be number 147, and can it be, would you stand to sing please? just said, join with me on cracking all those high notes, screeching and carrying on. The Bible says, make a joyful noise. So let's make a joyful noise on that second and the fourth stanza. He left his
Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for your many blessings, Lord. And I pray that you just bless this offering we're about to receive, that it may be put to use according to your will, Lord. Lord God, be with the preaching. And as Danny stands this morning, Lord, I pray that you just anoint him on high with the words to say this morning, Lord. I pray that you open every heart in this sanctuary to receive that word. Lord, and I pray, more importantly than anything, that if anyone's lost here today, Lord, that you just convict their heart, that they may come to know you before it's eternally too late, Lord. Just be with you this this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
give you the opportunity to sing that hymn. It's number 134 in your hymnal. We'll sing the first and the last stanzas, number 134, Jesus Paid It All. Let's stand to sing, please. I hear the Savior say, Let's join in prayer one more time before we get into God's Word, okay? Father, we come to the most important time in the service, time for us to open your Word, a time for me to share your Word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will anoint me today and give me freedom to share the truth of your Word. I thank you, Lord, for placing this subject on my heart. And I pray that it will be a blessing. I pray especially for anyone that may be here today struggling with this particular issue. And I pray especially for any that may be here lost today without Jesus, who've never exercised faith, in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, bless the reading and the proclamation of your word. May your word fall fresh and new on every heart and mind here today. And we'll be careful to praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that faith is at the heart of the Christian life. For example, and I, by way of introduction, I want to share several verses of Scripture with you to prove what I'm saying. For example, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. The just, meaning those who have been made right with God through salvation through the new birth experience through Jesus Christ. He says the just shall live by faith. Then in Romans chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says we, are, we as believers are to walk by faith. Matthew 21, 22 says we are to pray by faith. Ephesians 6 and 16, we are to resist evil by faith. 1 John 2, 13 through 17 says we are to overcome the world by faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 commands us to stand fast in faith. Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 24 tells us to be strong in our faith. Colossians 1, 23 says that we need to be grounded in our faith. And finally, Hebrews eleven six, 6, and this is a biggie. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So faith is a vital part of our Christian experience and Christian life, and as important as faith is to the Christian life, we find many Christians struggling to fully trust the Lord. 
Now, you know, as your pastor, I've always been transparent with you. I don't try to hide anything. I'm just me, okay? I'm nothing. I'm, no, I'm not an expert at anything. I'm just absolutely nothing. I'm just a man that God saved and called to the ministry. But I want you to know that because I walk in human flesh like all of you walk in human flesh, there are times when I struggle with my faith. Now, you may not be willing to admit that or not, that you have a struggle with your faith, but I do. I struggle at times with my faith. It's interesting how that we as believers can entrust our souls to God through faith, but we find it difficult to entrust other things to God in faith. For example, there are some parents who really struggle with trusting, with entrusting their children to God. And there's some husbands and wives, spouses, who have difficulty entrusting their spouse to God. There are some people who are struggling today with trusting God for their finances, with the economy in which we're living. So there, there are a lot of different um, areas of life that we may struggle in trusting God. And so I want to ask you this morning, if you're struggling with trusting God, what, what area are you struggling in? Are you doubting your salvation? Is it your finances? Uh, what is it if you're really struggling? Because you see, I, I understand through counseling with people and talking with people on a weekly basis that many, many Christian people really struggle with their faith. And so this morning, as we think about this whole idea of struggling to trust God, I want to share two things with you that I hope will help you. I hope that you will leave here today having been helped by the Word of God, that you will know better how to, to build your faith. And so I want to share two things with you. First of all, if you're struggling today with trusting God, I don't care what it is, if you're struggling with trusting God in any area of your life, one of the first things that you and I must do is that we must realize, listen, we must go back to the Word of God and the scriptural exhortations that we find in the Word of God regarding how you and I need to trust God. For example, and let me just give you a few. These are just in the Old Testament. I, I won't even mention any in the New Testament, but I want to mention four in the Old Testament, and I'll read those uh, for you. Psalm 37, 3 says, Trust in the Lord. Now listen to these verses very carefully. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Most of the time when you find the Word of God or God commanding us through His Word to trust Him, usually there's a benefit or a blessing from the trusting Him because that's faith. And faith and trusting are, are sort of synonymous, and so you, you, you can't, I don't know that you can distinguish the two uh, because when we talk about trusting, we're talking about relying upon a person, relying upon a person's integrity, a person's strength, a person's ability to do whatever we need them to do for us and, and for them to live the kind of life in which we can trust them. And certainly God can be trusted. And I'll tell you why this morning. But, but Psalm 37, 3, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit thy way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Did you hear that? Here's another blessing. Another benefit of trusting God. If we will commit our way to Him and trust also in Him, then He shall bring to pass what we need Him to bring to pass. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, and this is a very familiar verse, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He, God, shall direct thy paths. Again, God said, here's a benefit, here's a blessing of trusting me. If you'll trust me, then I will guide your paths. I will direct your life. And then what about Isaiah 26, 4, which says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Let me read that. Trust ye in the Lord forever. So as we think about trusting the Lord and we think about how oftentimes we grow weak in our trust and weak in our faith, th then certainly we need to go back to the scriptural exhortations 
that exhorts us to trust in the Lord and remember them. We need to memorize them and remember them because when we fall, when we grow weak in our faith, all we have to do is go back and remember those exhortations, remind ourselves of those, and then walk in them. Stand on them and walk in those exhortations, expecting God to do what he says he will do. But then there's a second thing I want us to see this morning, and here's where I want to settle down for a few minutes uh, in, in this message, and that is the, uh, we need to go back to the sure foundation upon which we build our trust in the Lord. And what is that? Well, I want to mention three things. Now, now listen to me carefully. I believe these three th things are absolutely essential, and I believe it's so important that we think about these three things, that we believe these three things, and that we, we do these three things. First of all, we must think about God and who He is. And one of the first things I want to mention is God's attributes. The sure foundation upon which you and I build our trust in the Lord, it, listen, is God's divine attributes. His attributes. And I want to mention six attributes there are, mo there are others, but I want to mention six that are absolutely essential. Number one is God, listen at this now, God is omnipotent. Now, that's a word that we don't use often. I don't use it often, but it is a word that describes how God is unlimited, listen, in his power. He has infinite power. The word omnipotent. That means that God can and will provide anything that you and I need in life because he has the power to do that. Whatever we need, he can do it. The Bible says that nothing is impossible with God. And so when we begin to think about trusting this God in whom we believe, then we must think about his divine attributes, and one of them is his omnipotence. He is absolutely omnipotent, all-powerful, infinite power, unlimited power. I think about not only his omnipotence, I think about his omniscience. God is omniscient. And that word means simply that he has infinite knowledge. Not only does God have infinite power, but God has infinite knowledge. The Bible says that he knows everything, past, present, and future. Did you hear me? God knows everything, past, present, and future. He knows what you and I don't know. He sees over the hills and around the curves. As we're walking through life, you and I can't foresee what we're going to encounter around the next curve or over the next hill, but I can assure you that God Almighty in heaven knows exactly what's coming. And so he is not only omnipotent, he is omniscient. He sees and he knows everything. I want to show you something here in, uh, in um, uh, Matthew chapter 6. And listen to this. The Bible even says that he knows what we need before we pray. It said, we've been studying this, this passage. I've been in this passage, these verses, the last several Wednesday nights, teaching about prayer. And listen to what Jesus said here in, in Matthew 6. Uh, he said, Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Watch this. For the Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. That's speaking of his all-knowing. Listen, God knows everything. And so he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, but thirdly, I think about God's omnipresence. He's omnipresent. What does that mean? That simply means that God is ever-present in every circumstance. And there is not a place that you nor I nor any other person can go to escape the presence of God. I mentioned this verse this morning, and I know some probably thought, well, I've never read that before, or I don't know if that preacher's dead on about that or not. But I want to read you a verse of Scripture just to, to prove to you that there's nowhere you can go to escape the very presence of God. And, and it's interesting what the psalmist says here in Psalm 139, Psalm 139 and verse 8. Listen to this. The psalmist said, well, let me back up in verse uh, 7. He says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? 
or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Are you listening? This is the question the psalmist is asking God. Where shall I go to get away from your presence? And listen at the response. Or he says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. In other words, the psalmist is saying, there's absolutely nowhere I can go to escape the very presence of God. And you can't. And my dear brethren, listen, how important that is to remember that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere you go. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says the day that you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came to live within your body. And your body became the temple of the Holy Spirit. And everywhere you go, guess what? You take God with you. Everywhere you go, you take God with you. That's why it's, it's important for us to, to always watch where we go. Because we don't want to take God in some of the places that we go. Amen? I'm telling you. We need to watch where we go and what we do because God is ever-present. He is always with us. And so we've got this God that we know, that we serve, that we love, that we try to obey. He is an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent Father. But not only that. And I think about God's attributes and how important it is. Listen, this is what I, 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 I rest on. This is the basis for for, for my faith and my trust in God. It is His divine attributes, who He is. And I think about not only His omnipotence and His omniscience and His omnipresence, I think about His love. I think about God's love. 1 John 4 and 8 says that God is love. And because He is love, God cares. That's right. God cares. God cares about you. You say, oh, but preacher, you don't know who I am. You don't know my life. It doesn't matter. God still loves you. The Bible says that God loves us when we were unlovable. The, God, God, the Word of God tells us that uh, God sent His only begotten Son to this world to die for us before you and I were ever born. He looked down through the future and saw every single one of us because He, does, he has foreknowledge. He does see ahead. He knows what's coming. He, he knew who was going to be born. And He looked down into the future. And he saw every one of us. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died for everyone in every generation. And when we were at our worst, when we were ungodly, when we did not know the Lord, when we did not care about God, we did not care about knowing God, guess what? God loved us. And he cared for us. And he demonstrated that love by sending Jesus Christ, his son, to the cross to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Every one of God's children are objects of His concern and attention. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 7 that the Christian is to cast all their care upon Him. Why? Because God cares for them. Did you hear that? God cares. He does care. As a result of His love, He cares and He reaches out. I think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Um, let's begin reading in verse 7. And here again Jesus is teaching on prayer. And listen to what he says. He uses an analogy that is so familiar to every single one of us in this passage. Listen to what he says. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Jesus is saying, if you want something from me or the Father, all you have to do is ask. He says, for everyone that asketh, receive it. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Watch this now. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? In other words, he uses the earthly parent as an example. And he says, what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, and you're human, and you're sinful, and you're frail, and you fall short. But I'm perfect. God is speaking now. Jesus is God, and he's speaking. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So he's, he's proven it over and over again that he's a God that cares. And so we think about His omnipotence, His omniscience, His omnipresence. We think about His love, but then I think about His holiness. If I'm going to trust someone, 
If I'm going to put my complete trust in someone, then I need to know who they are and I need to know what kind of person they are. And that's what I'm trying to do is to describe to you the kind of God that we say that we know and that we serve. The kind of God that we find in the Bible. And so we have to think about not only his, listen, his love, but we've got to think about his holiness. God is holy. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God said, I want you to be holy because I myself am holy. Therefore, God will always do what is good. God will always do what is right. God will always be just in his dealings. Deuteronomy 32 and 4 says, He, God, is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. So, if God is omniscient, and he is, if God is, is omnipotent, and he is, if God is omnipresent, and he is, and if God is love, like the Bible says he is, and he is, and if God is holy, as the Bible says he is, and he is, then we're talking about someone we can really trust here. But you see, you think, oh, well, you know, what if God changes his mind about something? Well, let me give you a final attribute that I want to mention today, and I want you to get this one. The Bible says in James 1 and 17 that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. You know what that means? That means that God is immutable. I had someone come to me after the early service was over this morning. They said, Pastor, we're so glad you taught. I'm so glad you taught me a new word. I said, what was that? He said, immutable. He said, I didn't know what that word meant. It means unchangeable. God is immutable. He is unchangeable. He never changes. God always remains the same. Remember what the Bible says about Jesus? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he never changes. So, look what we have here. We have a God that is omnipotent, infinite power. We have a God that is omniscient, infinite knowledge. We have a God that is omnipresent. He's ever-present. Everywhere we go, he's with us. We have a God that loves us, that is pure love. God is love. It doesn't say that love is God, but it says that God is love. And we have a God that is holy. He can't do wrong. He's always, he always has to do right. And we've got a God that never changes. Now, you tell me, how can you beat that? How can you beat those? How, how can you beat those truths? And they're all right there in the Word of God. So we have someone that we can trust. So listen, if you're, if you're growing weak in your faith and you find that your trust level is weaning, I want to remind you that you need to go back and, and place, listen, place your trust and build your trust upon the sure foundation of who God is on His divine attributes but I want to mention a second thing not only do we find this sure foundation to be built upon God's attributes but secondly upon God's activity you say what do you mean well it's one thing for us to take the Bible and read the Bible and, and try to believe what we read and only God and I had someone tell me in the early service this morning well actually they were coming back into the sanctuary about to leave I guess uh, after the after Sunday school, and they said, you know, pastor said, even God gives us the ability to have faith and believe, and that's exactly right. We can't even have faith and believe in God apart from him. The Bible says apart from the word of God, we can't have faith. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so God is the one that has given, given us the word. And so God is the one that allows us to believe when we hear the gospel and we're able to believe in Jesus Christ and put our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for our eternal salvation. But when we think about God, listen, being immutable, we're thinking about not, not only God not changing, but His Word never changes. 
God's word will never change. And every promise that he has given in the word of God that, that uh, should be fulfilled up to this point has already been fulfilled. Why? Because God never changes. He says what he means and he means what he says. God's not going to look down here one day and say, Hey, y'all, I believe I made a mistake in the Bible. I'm going to take it back for a short time. I'll give it back to you later. Uh-uh. When God finished the book, it was finished. And you can take it to the bank. What God said, you can take to the bank. It's solid. His word never changes. And so when we think about trusting God, we must think about these things and think about his activity because it's not enough just to look at the word of God. But what about God proving to us and demonstrating to us that he is who he says he is? Now, if I had just met Shane Watson, he and I had just met, and we sort of hit it off and we wanted to become friends. Do you think I would, I would really trust him until I got to know him? Now, you see, a lot of Christians are like that. A lot of, a lot of people have gone to God and they've prayed a prayer of faith and, and, and they've been saved, but they've never grown in their relationship with God. They've never done anything to develop their relationship nor to develop their faith. And as a result of that, they have a very shallow and superficial relationship with God and as a result of that their faith is very weak and I'm not saying that to be critical I'm just saying that realistically and, and be, to be honest and I say that in love and only a person knows and God knows where they are in regards to their the depth of their faith and the degree of their faith and I don't even know that we even understand that uh, but uh, anyway we need to grow and how do we do that if I, was going to, if I was going to begin a relationship with Shane Watson, I would not really begin to trust him until I really came to know him. And when I really got to know Shane, he would, through his words and his actions, actions would prove to me that he was a man of integrity, that he was reliable, trustworthy, honest, and then I could trust him. And that's the way it is with God. You see, God demonstrates who he is in the lives of his children. And he lets us know. He lets us know that he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. He lets us know that he's omniscient, he's all-knowing. He lets us know that he's ever-present and he never leaves us nor forsakes us. He lets us know that he's love. He lets us know that he's holy. He lets us know that he's immutable. He demonstrates those things to us, not just through the Word of God, but through our own living experience. I, I think about uh, times that God has revealed to me his power, man. I tell you what, I've seen, I've prayed. I have prayed for people, certain individuals over a period of time. Pray for their salvation. And I've seen God, the power of God move in the lives of those people and reach down and, and bring them to the point of faith and salvation. That's the power of God. I've seen God provide things for me that I could not provide for myself. There have been times when I, my wife and I didn't have groceries in the house, didn't have food to go on the table and fall on our knees and pray and have a woman that come to, to come to knock and knock at our door, a woman that we did not even know and that did not know us, a Christian woman who said, God spoke to my heart and told me to bring you some groceries. I've needed tires on my car. I told the early service crowd, I said, Daddy used to, you know, we was talking about, we'd run tires, they just almost blow out. And Daddy, Daddy would always say, well, you can see the air in those things. And, uh, you know, cords hanging out and everything else. Be running tires, didn't have any money to buy tires. Fall on my knees before my Father in heaven and say, Father, I need a set of tires. Have a man come to my door, knock on my door and say, Preacher, God told me to go buy you a set of tires. You say, oh, but preacher, that's because of who you, that's because you're a minister. Hey, folks, I've got news for you. Wake up. That's for every single believer. It's not just for preachers. It's for every single believer. There have been times when I didn't have money to pay a bill. God would send the money. Through prayer and faith in him, what was he doing? Every time I faced a challenge in my faith, it was an opportunity for God 
to reveal himself strong on my behalf. And God was trying to teach me that he's all powerful, that he can do anything in my life. He can provide every need that I have no matter what. He was teaching me that he's ever present with me and in every circumstance and situation that I encounter in my life. He was teaching me that he has all knowledge that he knew my needs before I ever prayed and asked him to meet my needs. He was teaching me that he is holy and he is just and he is a good God and he is a God of love and he is a God that never changes because you know what? Over all of these years, my God has never changed and he's always remained just where he's always been. And if you're a Christian today, you can say the same thing if you have an intimate walk with the Lord. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not saved, all of this is Greek to you. You, you. You've never had these experiences. You don't know what it's like to have to trust God and cry out to Him and see Him answer prayers that no one else knew about and no one else could answer. That, that's why I like to pray things in private. And I like to go into my closet, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, go into your closet and shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in secret, who sees in secret, who knows in secret, but who will reward you openly. Because you see, when you come out of your closet, when you come out of your closet from private worship and prayer, where you've spent time on your knees and time with your Heavenly Father, and you've, you have, you've emptied your heart to your Heavenly Father, and, and, and you've been able, and that's, that's therapeutic, you empty your heart and your soul to your Heavenly Father and you, you lift up all of those requests to Him and then you come out of your closet and you wait with great expectation, waiting on God to answer those prayers. And when He begins to answer those prayers one by one, then you get on shouting ground. You get on shouting ground because you know no one else heard those prayers but your Father who is sees in secret. No one else knew. I can tell you things this morning that no one else knew but just me and God, things that I prayed about and prayed for that no one else knew but me and God. And no one, listen, no one else could have answered those prayers but God alone. What does that do? When you experience that, that increases your faith. It, it develops your trust. It's sort, of like, it's sort of like exercising your body. If you don't exercise your body, guess what happens? You become flabby and your muscles weaken. But if you, if you exercise, do some push-ups, do some, you know, I mean, get some weights and start working those muscles, guess what happens? Those muscles begin to build up in your arms. Man, they get bigger and bigger and bigger because of how much you work out and, and, and so forth. But you build up your muscles in your body. It's the same way in the spiritual realm. In our spiritual life, every time God issues you and me a challenge in our faith, it is a time that God is trying to stretch our spiritual muscles. And He's developing our faith. And the more our, mus our spiritual muscles are stretched, the more our faith develops until, as the Word of God says, we are to have strong faith and we're to be grounded in our faith and not our feelings. Too often we rely on our feelings rather than the facts and the truth and, the, and our faith in, in the Lord. So through God's activity in our lives, God reveals Himself. Every answered prayer has been a witness to God's love loyalty, concern, and watch care over us. And listen to this. Every provision we have in life, many of which we have never prayed for or asked God for, God has provided out of His love and care. Do you realize that there's some of us who are sitting here this morning who were born in the United States of America who has never really known what it is like to be hungry and thirsty. And you know what? We've never thought about it. We, we, we grew up having food and water and shelter. 
We grew up having those things, and so we just take them for granted, not realizing that everything that you and I have, everything that comes our way, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no verbalness or shadow of turning. And we take those things for granted. That's why it's so important when we sit down at a table, wherever we may be, by the way, to eat a meal, we need to bow our heads and thank our God in heaven for what's before us. Because as you know, there are many people in this world that go hungry every day. I mean hungry. The many things we take for granted were all provided by Him. And so when we think about this sure foundation upon which we build our trust, we build our trust upon God's attributes, we build our trust upon God's activity, and finally, listen to this, we build our trust upon God's awesome Word. His awesome Word. Psalm 111, 7 says, The works of His hands are verity and judgment. Listen to this. All, A-L-L, all His commandments are sure. They are sure. That means they will never fail. They will come to pass. They're valid. You see, God says what He means, and He means what He says. Every time He speaks, and listen, do you understand that primarily today we have the written Word of God, which is God's direct Word to you and to me. If you want to know something from God, just go to the Word. He'll tell you. He'll teach you. He'll instruct you. The Word of God that's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. They cut to the deepest recesses of a person's heart and being. And so, my dear brethren, if you're here today and you're struggling with trusting in the Lord, I want to just recommend that you go back to those scriptural exhortations that we read and others in the Word of God and just reflect back on them. And secondly, I want to recommend that you start, listen, you start building your trust upon God Himself, His attributes, His activity, and His awesome Word. You start building your trust on those things and listen. You will find if you will allow God to do a work in your heart through the trials and tribulations and the adversity that you and I encounter in life, if you will just stop and say to the Lord, Lord, what is it you want me to learn through this situation? God will open up your heart and your mind through the Word of God and He will teach you what you need to know. And He will grow you in your faith. And I trust that God will develop your faith and my faith and our faith will become strong faith and that you and I will be grounded in our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, if you're here this morning and, and, and you're not saved, listen, it all begins for you. It all begins with God. God must take the initiative to come to you to allow you to hear the Word of God. He must convict you of that word of, uh, uh, and regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And when he draws you, he gives you, he motivates you, he gives you that sense of need, then that's the time that you need to come to Christ. And he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And when he does that, then be willing to turn from your sin, repent, and turn to Christ in faith, taking God at his holy word, and the Bible says, and I use this at the close of a lot of our services, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world. The world includes every person, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And if you're here today 
Oh, I pray if the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you and convicting you and you feel and sense and know your need of God and of Jesus in your life, how I pray that today you will come and surrender your heart and life to Him. And if you're here today and you're a believer and you're struggling with trusting God with some particular area of your life or something or someone, then I, I just trust that God will use this message in your life to encourage you and you will use what you have heard today, not because I've shared it, but because it's straight from the book. Use God's Word. Use it. Be obedient to it. And God can and will bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for reminding us of who you are and what you can do and what you have done in our lives in the past serves as a testimony and a demonstration of your great love and concern and who you are in our lives. Lord, I pray that we will learn how to better develop our relationship with you and grow in our faith, that we will be strong in our faith, we will be grounded in our faith. So, Lord, help us. Save the lost, Father. Encourage and bless the saved is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.